Behavioral genetics has been going on for over a century. The modern era began in 1960 with a book called Behavioral Genetics. But people have been interested in nature and nurture for recorded history. Animal breeders knew that you could breed for behavior. And most animal breeding involves behavior as much as it does biology. You know, you think of all the dog breeds, they're mostly bred for functional behavior. It's for very specific things like pointers point and scent hounds smell. And it's hard to get another breed to do that. You try to get a, a you know, a, a, a collie to point. You know, they won't point. Try to get uh, a pointer to round up sheep. You know, so for a long time we've known that genetics is important, but psychology rejected it for humans. You know, fair enough. But after a century of research, things have changed dramatically. Most psychologists now accept an important role of inherited DNA differences. So much so that it's no longer interesting to say, oh, here's another trait, another measure. Let's see if it's heritable. You can save time by just saying, yeah, it is. It's going to be. We've got to ask more interesting questions. And the big one is, can we find some of the genes? And that's been a, a revolution. And it's just now reaching a point where we're identifying some of the genes to be able to make individual predictions. And this isn't just psychology. This is all of the life sciences. They've all come to this position. Everything's heritable. Let's find some of the genes. Because if you can find the genes, you can understand pathways between DNA, RNA, uh, uh, met metabolism, proteins, brains, and behavior. And so that's the original goal, is to find some of the genes so you can really understand the mechanisms between genes, brain, and behavior. But what we've learned from these new strategies that just came out really in the last 10 years or so called genome-wide association studies, where you have a little chip the size of a postage stamp, and it allows you to genotype hundreds of thousands of DNA markers throughout the genome, which are the 23 pairs of chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs of DNA. You can tag it throughout the genome. So genome-wide association study is an atheoretical approach to find the genes for heritable traits. The biggest thing that's come out of that is that uh, the biggest effects are much smaller than anyone ever thought. So the, the biggest effect we know of for, say, a complex trait is one gene called FTO, which predicts body weight, you know, how heavy you are corrected for height, called body mass index, it's called. Well, that accounts for about 1% of the variance in weight. But that's by far the biggest effect that's been found. And 1% translates to this. You know, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a stretch of DNA that has two forms, A and T, it's called. If you're AA, you're three pounds lighter than the average. If you're AT, you're average. If you're TT, you have three pounds greater. So it's like a six pound difference. That's what one percent of the variance is. That's the biggest effect. The average effect sizes are less than 0.01. It's really like 0.1 percent. 0.1 percent of the variance. Incredibly tiny effect. That's the biggest effects. And what we're guessing now is that the smallest effects are very much smaller. So if we're talking about here the biggest effects, the smallest effects account for most of the heritability. So what that means is we're not looking for the gene or even a handful of genes. We're now talking about thousands, tens of thousands of genes that we put together in what we call a polygenic score, multiple gene score. And we're now beginning to use those to predict uh, genetic uh, propensities in a population. So for height, we can now explain with DNA alone 20% of the variance. With weight, about 15% of the variance. So that means the, the difference, the thing here is you could predict that at birth about an individual. And in psychology and psychiatry, we're nowhere near that. With schizophrenia, people say they can explain about 10% of the genetic risk with DNA alone. With these, they're called chips, these little postage size stamp um, uh, slides, in a way, that you use to genotype DNA that you just get from saliva. So to detect these small effects, you need huge samples. So the sample sizes are in the hundreds of thousands. So you need hundreds of thousands of people who have been genotyped on hundreds of thousands of 
SNPs, we call them, single nucleotide polymorphisms. It's just the DNA variant. And that's what we need to be able to detect these tiny effects. But when we get up to those sample sizes, we are detecting those effects. So for behavioral traits that I study, um, uh, like intelligence, six months ago we were able to explain 1% of the variance. We can now explain 5% of the variance. With educational achievement, though, we can explain 10% of the variance. So that means you take these tests, in, in England we have these tests called GCSE, which all children at the age of 16, at the end of compulsory schooling, have to take, national exams. We can explain 10% of the variance on that. Now that's, we just got started, and we can explain 10% of the variance. It's about 60% heritable, so we've got a long way to go. But with 10%, what it means is if you take the top fifth uh, in terms of these genetic scores, we call polygenic scores, the kids who are in the top fifth are 65% likely to go to university. The kids in the bottom fifth are 35% likely to go. So even with only explaining 10% of the variance, that's a pretty big difference in terms of predicting at the high and low extremes. So I'm really into this because I want to be able to predict genetic strengths and weaknesses at the individual level. That's not to say, it's not like family risk. If you had a first degree relative who's alcoholic, you have a five-fold greater risk of being alcoholic. But so does your brother, because it's just a family risk. That doesn't work for people, because there's big genetic differences within a family. You and your brother can be genetically quite different. But with DNA, you're able to make a specific risk. We could say, you're at risk for becoming alcoholic, your brother is not. And what that would mean then is if you guys drink the same amount of alcohol, you're going to become alcoholic. Your brother won't be. This is just, you know, in terms of the genetic prediction. It's not all genetic, but it's saying that genetics uh, can make a pretty good prediction about some of these things. And when we do that, it'll change research because it's so cheap to do this now. These chips I talked about, when I first did it, they cost about uh, 3,000 pounds. They're now 40 pounds. It's cheaper than much of the stuff we do in psychological research. You need big samples to find these polygenic scores. But once you find them, you can use them in studies, in small studies, like in neuroimaging studies or in psychological studies. So it's going to change the face of research because we're going to get DNA on everyone. Uh, Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health and was the director of the Human Genome Project, he says that within a few years, all newborns will not just be given, will not just be genotyped on a chip, their whole DNA sequence of three billion base pairs will be sequenced. And you can put it on a little memory stick. And once you've done that, that's the end of genotyping and collecting DNA. You don't need DNA anymore. Everyone will have all their DNA bases on this memory stick. And then we'll use that then to create these polygenic scores to make genetic predictions of risk. And for me especially, what I'm interested in is reading disability and reading ability are highly heritable. What we do now is we wait till kids get to school, they fail at reading, and then we try to do something to fix it. You could predict which kids are likely to be at risk. And we already know that almost all kids who are reading disabled had language problems earlier. You can't do reading interventions in three-year-olds because they can't read. But you can do language interventions because there's very good language programs. But an important point is most successful interventions are expensive and intensive. So you can't do them with everybody. But if you could identify the kids who will be at risk for reading, you could intervene with language. And it wouldn't hurt them. It's not like giving them a drug or something. It's only good you know, to have people helping you with your language. And then when they go on to school, they'll be less likely to have a reading problem. So all of science medicine now is focused on predicting and preventing problems waiting, rather than waiting until the problems occur and then trying to fix them. So this is beginning to happen now. Um, people are doing it on their own. 23andMe is this company that will do this for you, this genotyping, for about 100 bucks, for example. So lots of people are doing it, and they're beginning to do it for their children. The reason I think it's important to get this message out now, before it really hits the ground, you know, explaining 10% of the variance is a lot. You know, uh, if you want to predict, like, school achievement, what's the, what, what would you use to predict that? 
Nothing else will get near this 10%. 10% is a lot, but we've just begun. People don't even know about this yet. But when they do, I think they will begin to take genetics seriously in education. Right now, they totally ignore genetics. And I think there are some uh, very good things, they're, they're good discussions that ought to begin now before this really becomes reality, even though it's getting close to reality already. And I think, you know, a lot of people say how terrible this is. Imagine you're going to predict which kids have reading problems. I think that's good. Now, there's a lot of doom mongers who say, oh, you label kids. Well, kids get labeled already. You know, there are problems. We've got to discuss those problems. But I'm a cheerleader for this. I think we can do a lot of good at predicting and uh, preventing problems from occurring. But even right now, before we find the genes, we've got to start th realizing that genetics is very important. It accounts for mar far more variants than anything else. And what that does is it makes us recognize that people differ genetically. It, it isn't all due to learning or willpower or personality. It's, you know, DNA differences from early in life. And when we recognize those differences, we might respect them more. So I think one message that comes out of genetics is tolerance. Like right here in the, in the UK, weight is a major issue, you know, the obesity epidemic. And people are seriously saying that overweight people should be made to pay for the disorders that occur. They ought to have to pay for their National Health Service because it's their fault. They're, they're fat. Why don't they just lose weight? But if you recognize the genetics, 70% of the differences are due to genetics, you realize it doesn't mean you can't lose weight. If you stop eating, you lose weight. But if you're thin, you don't recognize how difficult it is for someone with a genetic propensity to put on weight and to have great difficulty losing it. You know, it, it's just a lot harder. And with learn, a reading disability, it doesn't mean genetics means you're not going to teach kids to read. It just means some kids are going to find it much more difficult. And we need to recognize that instead of, say, in the case of education, blaming the schools, blaming the parents, parents blaming the kids, um, and, and with obesity, blaming you for being a slob. You know, just get a grip. Have some willpower here. Lose weight. And, you know, so I think if we recognize it's, it's easier for some people to say that than other people, we might become more tolerant. But at least what it will do is have us realize people are different. And that suggests that medicine, you know, we talk about precision medicine, that's basically genetics. Not uh, prescribing drugs one size fits all, not having a national curriculum one size fits all, but recognizing that people differ genetically and they need interventions that are personalized to them. So I think that's one of the big messages that come out of this, even before we identify the specific genes that are involved.